Now it's time for our first presentation, and I'd like to welcome Colonel Brian Laidlaw, the 325th Fighter Wing Commander at Tyndall Air Force Base. Colonel Laidlaw actually rode out the hurricane uh, uh, at Tyndall Air Force Base that day in October and has been leading the massive recovery effort uh, that began the next day. Colonel Laidlaw. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it really is great to uh, stand up here and look out over this crowd. I'm told 450 plus, maybe even pushing five, uh, 500 today. Uh, I know your time is precious, and the fact that you chose to spend some of your time with us today uh, means a lot, and we appreciate it. Sir, Mr. Henderson, thank you very much for uh, coming to share with us your thoughts and your perspectives from the absolute highest levels uh, of our Air Force. It really is great to hear from you uh, about our base down here at Tyndall. So, sir, thanks for coming down with us uh, today. So for nearly 80 years, our base and our community have grown in near perfect harmony. Your enduring support is unquestionably second to none. We do not take your support for granted. We revere it. As we rebuild, we are gonna need that help now more than ever. Thank you all for being here today and thank you for choosing to be a part of something special. So this is why we're here. I know most of you have seen this picture before. You saw in the video some of the impacts that we saw across the base due to the storm. As Mr. Henderson alluded to, we sit on a beautiful peninsula of 29,000 acres. We're surrounded by 129 miles of coastline, and in my opinion, some of the most pristine beaches anywhere in the world. You can see those 29,000 acres on this picture uh, that's back behind me. Up here is the picture of the storm covering most of the Gulf of Mexico. If you zoom in on the eye at about 12.30 on the 10th of October, there you see our 29,000 acres. For reference, that eye is about 15 miles across. Nearly every structure on our base suffered some degree of damage. About a third of the structures were completely destroyed. Unlike our neighbors in Mexico Beach to the east and Parker up to the west, we did get a brief reprieve when the eye of the storm passed overhead, as you can see uh, in, in the picture right here. But even now, six months later, as I look at this picture, I am certain of one thing, that without question, the 10th of October 2018 has changed our community forever. And I like to think that it's given us an opportunity. And as the installation commander, it is truly my privilege to introduce those of you who are not familiar with Tyndall Air Force Base, some of the things that we do on the base and where we came from. Tyndall Air Force Base started as a gunnery school. It started back in 1940. Our first 2,000 students came, uh, came across the bridge and uh, showed up at our gates on the morning of 7 December 1941. Yes, that is Pearl Harbor Day. To this day, we continue every single month to graduate students across various specialties in our Air Force uh, to go on to assignments to the combat Air Forces. During World War II, we trained thousands of anti-aircraft artillery gunners, including Clark Gable. As uh, Mr. Henderson alluded to, we've been a longtime fighter base. It's fitting that this base takes its name from a World War I fighter pilot, Lieutenant Francis B. Tyndall. I had the privilege of meeting uh, Lieutenant Tyndall's daughter and his uh, three granddaughters who came to visit our base after the storm. In World War I, Tyndall commanded the 22nd Aero Squadron. He shot down four enemy aircraft. Some of his squadron mates say he actually shot down five. One of those missions, interestingly, was on October 29th, 1918, nearly 100, day, 100 years to the day before Hurricane Michael hit the base. The Army gave Lieutenant Tyndall a silver star for gallantry that day. Like so many who have gone before me, I am proud of Lieutenant Tyndall, and I am proud of our long history of training both soldiers and airmen right here in Bay County, and we hope for this to continue. This is Tyndall Air Force Base today. Tyndall Air Force Base is the home of the Checker Tails. The Checker Tails are the 325th Fighter Wing. 
The 25th Fighter Wing has two flying squadrons. Those are the pictures you see up here. We have a training F-22 squadron, the Air Force's only training squadron for F-22s. We also have a T-38 squadron, which is an adversary air squadron. Those squadrons are temporarily, temporarily conducting their flying operations just down the road at Eglin Air Force Base. As you work clockwise uh, around, the, uh, around the picture, I'll introduce you to some of our major mission partners and some of the important things and unique things in many cases that we do at Tyndall Air Force Base and provide to our, uh, to our Air Force. Starting at the top in the 12 o'clock position up there, you've got 1st Air Force, AF North, and the 601st AOC. These men and women provide overwatch for homeland defense for the entire continental United States, U.S. Virgin Islands, and Puerto Rico. They stand the watch 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And they've been doing it since December 21st, right after the storm. Next, you have the 53rd Weapons Evaluation Group, or as we like to call them, the WEG. At the WEG, we conduct all air-to-air -air and air-to-grounds weapons testing for our United States Air Force, as well as, in many cases, the Navy and uh, joint partners and coalition partners who deploy in from all across the world. These are the men and women who fly the QF-16s that you often see flying, uh, flying nowadays. These are the F-16s with the orange painted tails and, uh, and wingtips. Next is uh, the Red Horse Squadron, the 823rd Red Horse Debt One. They run our Silver Flag exercise. The Silver Flag exercise gives our Air Force's civil engineers and many other Air Force specialty codes the opportunity to deploy into a remote location, figure out how to stand up a base from a bare bones condition, how to conduct Air Force missions no matter what their circumstances are, and then how to break that base down and turn the land back over to the host nation. All the men and women who are deploying overseas fighting our nation's wars in that type of a scenario are coming through our Silver Flag site, located down on the east side of our, air, uh, outside of our property down close to Mexico Beach. We're also home to a portion of the Air Force Civil Engineering Center. You're going to hear a lot more from Air Force Civil Engineering Center, or as we like to say, AFCAC, later today. Among the many things that they do for our nation, here at Tyndall, they do extensive research and development, including how to make our bases more resilient in the future. Next, you have the 337th Air Control Squadron. These are our Air Battle Manager's schoolhouse. All the men and women who do uh, that mission set, whether it's in AWACS, the aircraft with the radar over the top, or at our control reporting centers all across the globe, all of those men and women come through the gates of Tyndall Air Force Base to get their initial training. As Mr. Henderson alluded to, Tyndall Air Force Base also gives us access to some of the best tests and training ranges anywhere in the world. This is a picture of what Mr. Henderson was referring to in his remarks. The military airspace in the Gulf of Mexico stretches from New Orleans all the way to Key West, if needed. In the picture that you're looking at back here behind me, to, to give you a frame of reference, the top left-hand corner is Pensacola. The bottom right-hand corner is McDill, down by Tampa. In addition to the vast overwater airspace, we've got tremendous overland airspace up to the north and to the east, up in the top portion of the picture right here. Multiple times a year, out of Tyndall Air Force Base, we host an exercise called Checkered Flag. Checkered Flag is the most advanced air-to-air uh, -air integration exercise, or one of the most advanced air-to-air -air integration exercises that we do in the United States Air Force. Because of this airspace that you see back behind me here, aircraft will fly in from all over the southeast. They'll fly in from Eglin, from Tyndall. They'll come down from uh, Montgomery up in Georgia. Occasionally, they'll come down from Shaw in South Carolina. They'll come over from Jacksonville and occasionally New Orleans. The tankers will fly up from McDill, and they'll all meet just south of Tyndall Air Force Base and provide our airmen some of the best training that we have to offer. Tyndall sits right in the middle and that's what makes us strategic. Tyndall does not have, as Mr. Henderson alluded to, Tyndall does not have some of the encroachment challenges that face some of our other bases. Because of those 29,000 acres and our runway infrastructure, we are able to keep those runways in relatively isolated locations. They're not in close proximity to heavily populated areas. And this base loves the hear, or this community loves to hear the sound of freedom. I hear that all the time. Lastly, our base boundary, the base property itself, 
bumps right up against these warning areas that you see behind us. That enables us to launch drones, aircraft without pilots, often with explosives uh, uh, connected to them, directly off our runways out into, uh, into warning areas. Those aircraft never leave military-controlled airspace. That is unique capability that we have at Tyndall. I don't think it's a stretch to say that these ranges are truly a national treasure. Tyndall is the star right in the middle of this picture. That is where we sit, and that is one of the many things that we offer to our country. So as you saw in the video, airmen are a resilient bunch. We're pretty proud of the fact that we get the mission done despite the circumstances. Despite all that damage and the setbacks, the mission does go on at Tyndall, as we've alluded to earlier. On this slide here are just a few examples of the things that we continue to do every day because that's what our secretary expects out of us. So early next week, you may see, or you will see if you come out to Tyndall, an additional 47 fighters on our ramp. These fighters are coming from bases in England, Japan, and up in Virginia to do our air-to-air -air weapons testing and also to conduct one of those checkered flag exercises that I talked about before. QF-16s, like the picture you see uh, up here in the top left, they fly out of our, uh, off our runways nearly every day. They've remained uh, stationed at Tyndall, and they were among some of the first aircraft to restore our flying operations. Yes, up in the top right, that is an F-16 that is flying. And no, there is not a pilot in the seat of that aircraft. The fact that we can fly airplanes like this uh, without pilots in them without the encroachment problems we have, is a unique capability to Tyndall Air Force Base. Okay, down here in the uh, bottom left, that's our silver flag site. That's an Air Force civil engineer. He's standing next to a runway that we just intentionally blew up to draw a bit, draw, uh, create a large hole in the runway to see how he and his fellow airmen, how quickly they can repair that hole in the runway. You can't do things like that in close proximity to other uh, populated areas. The, this section here, that's the uh, floor of the 601st Air Operations Center. They resumed their air, air sovereignty mission very quickly after the storm in early December. Right in the middle, you have a student from our air control squadron. This lieutenant's going to go on to an assignment in an AWACS or a ground control station somewhere around the world very soon. We've already graduated our first three classes post-storm. We're on pace with our air control squadron this year to graduate more students than we did last year. And next year, the Air Force wants us to graduate even more. So the Air Force depends on Tyndall to train the next generation of air warriors from controllers to pilots to maintainers to engineers and to airmen from many other career fields as well. As we rebuild our facilities, these missions must continue. So I'll end with this slide. This is the Tyndall Air Force Base of tomorrow. You're going to hear multiple times today that we intend to rebuild Tyndall as the Air Force Base of the future. Part of that future is the potential for exciting new missions, like the two that you see pictured up above. Secretary Wilson recommended to Congress in December that we use supplemental funding to rebuild Tyndall as the future home of up to three F-35 squadrons. That's the airplane to your left, my right. The aircraft on the right is an MQ-9 unmanned aircraft. Tyndall Air Force Base remains the preferred alternative to host 24 of these aircraft and as many as 1,600 airmen that will come along with them. So a lot has changed since we welcomed our first gunnery class to Tyndall back on the 7th of December, 1941. And admittedly, it would be much easier to rebuild the base that we had six months ago. But that's not why any of you are here today. We need your help to rebuild not the base that we had, but to rebuild the base that we need. Today we are getting missions done with short-term, temporary fixes all across the base. We look forward to partnering with many of you as we look to transition from those short-term fixes to more long-term, sustainable solutions. On Tyndall, we're ready to get started. Thank all of you for being here today, and we look forward to your questions later. Thank you. Thank you, Colonel Laidlaw.